The urbanization and industrialization of Boston was partly created by immigration through the exploitation of European workers, which created social and economical class distinction and segregation. Much of this segregation and class distinction can be illustrated by the city's transportation network that highlighted economic class and social standing of Boston citizens. The increased attention to social class led to an expectation of women's behavior, allowing men and women to access the public spaces which led to their invol involvement in Boston's development. In 1840, barely 30% of all Bostonians were foreign-born or were the children of foreigners. By 1880, the number goes from 30% from foreign-born to 64%. From the data, we can conclude that the numerical growth of foreigners had a huge impact on the population growth within a few decades. The increase in the numbers helped support the labor necessities that were needed to work in factories. The biggest ethnic group to enter Boston was the Irish after the potato famine. They would be used as cheap labor by the time the 1870s rolled around. They became middle class in the city. They would become part of Boston's first police forces. They would become investors in the city and become the city's elite. Since Boston was a port city, many immigrants were working in warehouses and unloading shipments. This area had a crossroad of different classes as the rich owned the warehouses where the immigrants worked. While working, the immigrants and the working class made an alliance with the idea of a progressive middle class. Together, they were able to create 8-hour workdays and better working conditions. As they progressed, they were able to also raise their pay in the future. Some of the unions are still at play today, such as the NEA, which is known as the New England Association of Farmers, Mechanics, and another is the National Education Association. Other reform groups, such as the CIS, which is known as the Charitable Irish Society, was created to help Irish women immigrants to get jobs and a place to stay. Besides working on the ports, other jobs the immigrants did was expanding the city. From 1870 to 1920, they would expand the city of Boston five times. They would also be used to work on transportation such as streetcars and also be part of the building of the first subway station in North America. Over time, they would have other jobs such as being part of the police force in working offices. There were so many immigrants, landowners land created triple-decker apartments that are still here till this day. And soon, for a variety of reasons, segregation would take place in Boston. As immigrants came into the city of Boston, they expanded it. As they came in, they occupied neighborhoods that were formerly white skilled labor workers lived. The white workers left the neighborhoods because they were dubbed a zone of emergence because of the many ethnic groups that were coming into the city. As they were coming into the city, they took over certain neighborhoods such as South Boston, Roxbury, Dorchester, East Boston, and Charleston. As the ethnic groups came into the city, the elite classes fled to the outskirts of the city but use the new immigrants to build a new, na new neighborhoods in the outskirts of town. They lived in the new industrialized suburbs such as Cambridge, Chelsea, Somerville, Watertown, and Quincy. Many of the immigrants lived near the ports uh, working in the factories. Even in ethnic places, each ethnic, ethnic group uh, lived in their own neighborhoods. Here are some examples of the ethnic neighborhoods in Boston. The north end of Boston was mainly Russian, Polish, Jews, and Italians. Over time, the Italians would be the majority of the neighborhood. These immigrants worked in small factories, unloading ships, and moving freights. These immigrant groups would focus on unskilled labor, which led them to getting uh, low pay. The west end was a neighborhood that built many new buildings in the neighborhood. The main ethnic group in that side of town were, was Jews and the Polish. The Jewish and Polish immigrant groups would push out the old re residents that were living there at the time, which were the Irish and African Americans. In the neighborhoods, more Eastern Europeans will come into the, into the neighborhood and become landowners and destroy many of the old wooden houses. 
This caused a change in the housing where they built three-story tenements. This made the West End one of the most dense neighborhoods in the city. Next is East Boston. The, grim the immigrants in that area were Russians, Italians, and the Portuguese. These people worked in factories, the railroads being developed, the docks that were built in 1875, the coal yards and machine shops to name a few. With new people coming in, there were, there were the creation of settlement houses, such as the Goodwill House and the Immigrant Home. It also created new housing buildings, such as the Triple Decker, similar to the West End. And the Jews would be the most predominant ethnic group in the area, as they would build several synagogues and create many successful businesses in the neighborhood. Just from these examples, many ethnic groups that were segregated in Boston were used as cheap labor. And they would be a part of a part of a new construction of the of the city, being transportation. The Industrial Revolution started the wave of urban development in Boston. With a growing urban development on the rise, Boston's transportation system was on the verge of becoming America's ideal model in transportation infrastructure. For example, in, nine, in 1888, the means of getting around the city were by horses that were putting streetcars. With, with the introduction of the electric trolley lines, helped improve the city's transit system was in fact beneficial. It faced bigger issues as many of the trolleys from Park Square and Tremont Street ended in downtown Boston. Then in 1897, Boston introduced America to its first subway, the Green Line, followed by undersea tunnel line, the Blue Line, which are still operating today. The transit system were built as a result to accommodate and help facilitate the city of Boston into a more 21st century and help to better daily commute to many middle class businessmen, office workers and professional workers that lived in the suburbs of the city. Downtown Boston was the epicenter of the growing prosperous city as Asia Weinstein states in congestion as a cultural construct. Downtown Boston Street in the 1890 were thronged with the people and vehicles. The downtown served as the civic, economic, and cultural heart of the region of over 800,000 people, many of whom used the extensive region trolley and commuter ra railroad system to travel downtown daily. With an ideal transit system, the, Bos the people of Boston were still complaining about the traffic congestion. With urban planning, many Bostonians knew more changes had to be made. For example, reducing the congestion by building new roads and improving the transit infrastructure or even possibly enforcing stricter traffic regulations. Along with the introduction of the automobile, only added the pile of congestion that was present. With traffic congestion a main concern for many Bostonians, Many fears prevented the growth of urban development. The evolution of Boston's underground subway steam helped minimize a lot of the traffic issues that the city of Boston was dealing with and helped contribute, contribute Boston as one of the premier urban cities in America. These many examples of the improved infrastructure allowed many of the people to travel in and out of the city in their leisure time to enjoy the new innovations with sports. As a result of urbanization and industrial developments in the U.S., many people in cities like Boston were separated by their social and economic classes. There are many ways of looking at how class extinctions are created. Throughout history, people many times have been categorized and separated into their separate class extinction. Segregation was a common occurrence, especially towards African Americans. In the start of the 19th century, the developments and organizations of sports gave people a new passion for sports in Boston and the rest of the nation. In U.S. cities like Boston, work weeks were very long, averaging about 60 hours per week in 1890. 
the average worker notched 66 hours in 1860. So after about 30 years, typical Americans began having about six extra hours of free time each week. As urbanization and the developments of the Industrial Revolution, people in Boston and many surrounding cities began seeing an additional 10 hours of average working time turn into free time. With all this free time, people living in Boston began participating in sports, leisure, amusements, and other types of activities, allowing men and women to access public spaces, which lead to their involvement in Boston's development. Baseball was quickly becoming a fan favorite and the national pastime. Originally, baseball can be considered as just a gentleman's game. With urbanization and industrialization, it turned into a form of mass entertainment, as cities and towns dedicated more and more public land and space for these purposes. Baseball became more and more popular in Boston. Even some who did not enjoy playing it still enjoyed watching and attending this form of mass entertainment. With the organization of baseball and other sports, classes and social distinctions w were created. Not only did that, but a color barrier had also been quickly established. Not all athletes and people were given an opportunity. African Americans and other minorities many times were segregated and not given equal treatment. Sports and other forms of mass entertainment began organizing and creating leagues where teams would be located in certain U.S. cities. The sports and baseball craze led to the financing of large stadiums or arenas such as Fenway Park in Boston. The first World Series championship was played in 1903 between the Boston Americans, a team in the American League, versus the Pittsburgh Pirates, a team in the National League. Fenway Park is still operating and in use today. Baseball was not the only popular sport where the increase in time and leisure were taking people. Boxing started becoming more respectable with new developments and the new innovation of gloves. Basketball was also invented around that time in 1891. It was invented in Massachusetts by James Naismith, a YMCA instructor. During the winter months in cold U.S. cities like Boston, sports were not always common or possible. Basketball was constructed as an indoor sport, so during winter months, basketball allowed people to access public space for athletic competition. In the 19th century, there was an increased participation in both amateur and professional level sports. The growth in sports in America was spurred on by many factors, such as increased leisure time, improvements in standard of living, as well as the overall shifting of increased populations. The large emancipation of African Americans and the large influx of immigrants from Europe also contributed to the social and economic class distinctions that sports created. Although sports during this period or even afterwards offered a safe heaven for the lower status members of society, allowing participants or people watching the ability to rise above some of the challenges of discrimination, societal mores, and other prejudices that they received through participation and achievement with these sports. It still created social and economic class distinctions between people. Beyond the growing working class and immigrants, there were other factors contributing to the rise of sports in America. Daily newspapers, cheaper printing developments, and telegraphy all helped to publicize national sporting news. Some of the sports we recognize today, baseball, football, boxing, track and field, were seeing a steady increase in event attendance in the 19th century. Sports history in Boston can be claimed to be the product of constant and continuation interaction of urbanization. With the rise of urbanization in sports in Boston, physical structures, social organizations develop with sports. Some results that sports and leisure brought demographic growth, economic development, the emergence of a positive sports creed, social reform, the formation of class and ethnic sub-communities. Sports heroes and legends were created, like boxer John L. Sullivan. In Boston, Sullivan was an Irish hero who represented working class values. With his size and swagger, he helped set the style for an American hero, sport or folk. Over time, Boston is legendary for its sports teams and the support of their fans, which are some of the most loyal and avid in the country. The city is home of Fenway Park, the oldest baseball stadium in the major leagues, and is still in use today. The Boston Red Sox continue to play their home games at Fenway Park. Legends and sports heroes were created, like Babe Ruth, who led the Red Sox to two World Series victories. Eventually, he would be sold to the New York Yankees, and that would come the curse of the Bambino. During the late 19th century, women contributed in Boston, showing that simply they weren't just housewives but able to do more. In some ways, women contributed in creating social programs such as MIHA, known as Massachusetts Emergency Hygiene Association. Where the program helped women with educational programs and health, MIHA was established in 1884 to continue lectures for women initiated by the Women's Education Association. MIHA objective was conducting free and private instruction in first aid, personal hygiene, and sanitary science. 
by giving free and private instruction and allow women to contribute to the society of Boston, showing how people should check their personal hygiene. Many of these people they show were police officers, firemen, mechanics, and factory operators. Miha also supervised recreational facilities such as playgrounds and sand gardens, especially in poor neighborhoods, and in the public bathhouse in the city's Italian district. Miha's objective was to run the playgrounds and recreational facilities to let Bostonian people to stay healthy and keep their hygiene clean since public bathhouses were in poor neighborhoods. Miha wasn't the only association created by women. There was also Young Women Press Association, YWCA, Women Education Industrial Union, YEIU, and Working Girls Club, WGC. Each of these associations dealt with beneficiaries' life, economic, moral, and physical. Most of these associations contribute to the economy, moral and physical lives of each association having to do different things in the economy and people's morals and physical life. The way the association contributed to the city was YWCA, founded in 1867, running gymnastic classes for working girls finding themselves at the close of the day too worn and tired for even the walk home, which they so much needed. YWCA were running gymnastics for working women being healthy was a big concern in South Boston in the 1870s, since many psychiatrists and social reformers recommended for women to be fit, mostly because women were vulnerable to diseases. Also, young women wore the same uniform as every woman where they were exercising. Many of the women had the same white handkerchiefs and shiny black shoes. YEIU sponsored lectures in psychology and personal health open a hygiene room where poor women could receive free advice and medical care. It conducted several investigations into the sanitary conditions of businesses where women work. Not only WEIU sponsored lectures in psychology and personal health, they also had investigations into sanitary conditions where women work. Open 1875, a small private school for 16 years and older was known as Wesley College founded by Henry Fowl Durant and wife Polly Henry Fowl Durant. Both they voted themselves on Christianity and education. Henry Fowl Durant left his job as a lawyer and Mr. Durant helped establish the Boston branch of the Young Women's Christian Association. Mainly the reason the college was created because both believed it was for the glory of God and to serve to the Lord Jesus Christ, also for the education and culture for women. During the late 1870s, the college had about 300 students, most from middle and upper class. The classes the college offered were English literature, composition, history, biblical studies, mathematics, and natural science. Wesley's primary importance was the help for young women. The, co the college also provided a lady physician to monitor the girl's health and hygiene. A woman that contributed to women's health was Ethel Perrin graduated from Boston Normal Schools of Gymnastics in 1892. Her career included the directorship of physical training in the public schools of Detroit and an administrative position with the American Child Health Association. In 1903, a survey in major training schools of the country discovered that 80% were currently enrolled, 70% of graduates were women. The most women were physical education specialists in public schools. Most of the women's association, Wesley College, and Ethel Perrin, and many more women changed the social health for women in Boston. With YWCA and other associations are still contributing to help empower women in promoting peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. In conclusion, the urbanization and industrialization of Boston was partly created by immigration through the exploitation of European workers, which created social and economical class distinction and segregation. Much of this segregation and class distinction can be illustrated by the city's transportation network that highlighted economic class and social standing of Boston citizens. The increased attention to social class led an expectation of women's behavior allowing men and women to access public spaces, which led to their involvement in Boston's development.